So in this session, we're going to uh, we're going to focus on um, best practices, uh, you know, no nonsense um, advice to put your AI ML projects on the right track. And there's a lot of confusion. There are a lot of buzzwords, and and it, it's really you know it's really not easy to to figure out how to get started, right? Um, so, by the way, please feel free to ask all your questions. I'm trying to keep an eye on um, to keep an eye on the uh, the, the chat. <laughs> uh, so I'll try to answer questions uh, as we go, and obviously we will have plenty of time after the session to go through questions. Okay, so don't be shy. Ask everything you want, and uh, and uh, we'll do our best to to answer as many as we can. Okay, all right. Let's get started now. So the first question, you know, uh, is is AI real? You know, is it is it a trend? Is it a buzzword? Um, you know, what's what's in it for for IT practitioners? Um, so does AI have a massive future in in the IT industry? Uh, will it grow? Will it keep you know going? Yes. Okay. Right. This is my prediction. Uh, you know, machine learning is about prediction. So this is mine. And if you have another question like that, insert another coin. You know as much as I do on this. Um, and I, I really, you know, I really don't know about 2030 or 2050 or 2070. I, I honestly don't think anyone knows anything. But, you know, people like to make those long term predictions. And and to be honest, you know, this is not really, uh, in my opinion, this is not really useful. I think that the better question is, how do we, uh, the builders, you know, the developers, the project managers, the architects, um, uh, the data scientists, how do we know how to get there? How to get from, okay, my organization wants to implement AI and machine learning, uh, to get that from that to oh we have projects in production and they run well and they solve business problems and we're happy about it and yeah I guess my answer now would be hmm you know not so sure um, IT has actually been around for a long time you know it, 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 I always find it a bit surprising that um, you know we tend to reinvent the wheel a lot. We tend to um, uh, forget that, uh, you know, uh, our ancestors have been have been building IT projects for literally, you know, 70 years now. Um, so it's almost a, 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 a person's life, right? A lifespan. So it's a long time. And if we want to know the future, we should look at the past, right? And see how we've collectively uh, done on... Uh, um, uh, understanding and implementing disruptive technologies, right? So if you want to see, okay, how 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 we how will AI adoption look like? How 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 good will we be at, at adopting? I think it's useful to see how we've done in the past. So um, some of you will remember the year 2000s, where we were trying to build um, web scale applications, uh, you know, websites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And honestly, I mean, the, the, the recollection that I have from those days is that generally it looked like that, right? A lot of projects, uh, you know, sunk uh, and, and died a, a, an awful death because, because we, we had no idea what we were doing. And then a few years later, everybody rushed and, and wanted to add e-commerce um, capabilities to their website, right? The big rush to, to e-commerce. And again, the way I remember it is that a lot of those projects ended underwater again because, because it, it was so new. Uh, we had no reference points. Uh, we didn't have a lot of best practices. We were just trying to build the best we could. But unfortunately, a lot of the projects went bad. Fast forward five years, mobile commerce ended up you know, pretty much the same. And there was a lot of pain and, and, and frustration involved because, again, new tools, new processes, new technologies, new business models, new everything, and we couldn't get it done right. 
And my favorite uh, was, you know, big data. Um, and boy, did that go wrong. You know, people rushing to uh, spend tons of money on uh, expensive Hadoop clusters and, and building, uh, you know, building teams around that and, and, and piling up data all, all the way to the moon and not really doing a great job at delivering business value. And again, I, I've made all those mistakes as well. So I'm, you know, I, I got eaten by just the shark again and again and again. So hopefully you, you had a better uh, experience with it. So what, I guess the, the first conclusion is that, you know, Jaws is not really a movie about sharks. It's really a movie about managing IT projects. Um, and yeah, it's the terrifying truth about tech projects. Um, we have uh, confused stakeholders, right? Remember in the movie, the the mayor and, and the business leaders of the town, you know, they want to keep the beaches open. They don't understand, you know, what the danger is. They just want to, the business to move along, right? But hey, it's not that easy. And, you know, business pressure to to keep all the tourists uh, coming to the island. And because, you know, business got to move on. You know, we can't we can't spend too much time thinking. We can't stand, spend too much time preparing. We, we need to keep business running. And, you know, unprepared team, obviously remember the sheriff and his deputies, you know, totally, totally unprepared for shark attacks and, and how to deal with that. Inadequate tools. Well, if you've seen the movie, you know, the way they start hunting that shark is <laughs> pretty rudimentary and it doesn't go well for a few of them. I uh, won't spoil the movie if you, if you haven't seen it, but I highly recommend it. Um, improved tact improvised tactics, you know, literally trying to, you know, make things up as they go. And, and of course, random arts of bravery, right? Uh, eventually, you know, they, they get the job done, but uh, it's, it's luck more than anything else. And, you know, I, I'm making this sound a little sarcastic, but we've all been on those projects where, you know, stakeholders don't really know what they want and, and they just want something and they put a lot of pressure on teams. And, and when dealing with new technology, it's really, uh, you know, it's really difficult to um, to figure out um, how to do that, how to build. Um, and, you know, m sometimes we actually get to the end, but again, frustrating, you know, burning out long hours uh, and, you know, quality, not what it should be. OK. But of course, people will always tell you, I mean, I remember, you know, uh, every every time new technology comes and they're going to say it's different. You know, it's the AI revolution. Uh, you know, um, old rules don't apply, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, well, a lot of people still keep saying that. And, you know, I don't want to finger point. You can you can you can make up your own opinion on who they are. I'm not interested in, in, in that. Uh, but I think this is why we keep um, failing or, or, or delivering very painfully every time we deal with new technology is because we, we forget that, you know, we've been there before. And even if you're, you know, junior in the IT industry, even if you're fresh out of school, people, you know, you can, you can work with people around you who've been there before and, and, and you should, you know, you should pay attention to what they're saying. You know, it's not just old people renting. They've seen this stuff before, even if they've never done AI. And well, there are certain ways of doing things right. All right. So hopefully, you know, 2020 and beyond is not going to look like that. You know, it's the whole point of this presentation. Look at best practices um, and, and, and certain, you know, uh, ideas that will hopefully save you from the shark, right? Because insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Um, by the way, a, a lot of people say Albert Einstein said this. Um, it looks like it could have been Mark Twain, but either way is fine. Uh, both are geniuses. <laughs> so whoever said it first is absolutely right. So we're all tired of being shark food, right? I, I'm not sure why I put a question mark on this. I can't see anybody enjoying being shark food. So. We want to move away from those negative things on the left, right? We're tired of that. And, and AI and machine learning is, again, a new cycle in the IT industry. And it's a chance to get away from that shark bait, uh, so to speak, and, and do, do it better. So 
instead of having confused stakeholders, we want to set expectations. Uh, we want to replace business pressure with clear metrics showing progress, incremental progress. We don't want to be unprepared, right? Maybe we don't have all the skills, but we, we need to know where we are. We need to assess the skills and then pick the right tools for the job according to those skills, okay? We want to use best practices. And um, one of my very strong beliefs here is that uh, traditional best practices, proven best practices for software engineering also apply to ML projects. And instead of, you know, running around fighting uh, randomly, uh, we want uh, a clear methodology, which is, of course, iterate, iterate, iterate. Okay, so let's look at all those... Um, Let's look at all those uh, uh, um, uh, points, right, one by one. So the first one is critical. Um, it's setting expectations. What is this project about? What are we trying to deliver? Okay. And you'd be, you know, of course, everybody should be nodding in front of their computer and say, yeah, well, sure, you know. Um, we, we, we wouldn't start a project unless we had a clear question. Well, <laughs> you would be surprised. Um, you know, um, no offense to, to, to our customers, but I still talk to a lot of people who, who are not quite sure what they're trying to achieve, right? They want to uh, invest in machine learning for sure, and they have good reason to do that. There, there are good um, questions to be answered in their businesses. But they're not super clear on what the question is. And I really, really, um, it's not as easy as it seems, right? Because it should be very, it should be crisp. It should be literally one sentence on the whiteboard. Um, you know, no, nothing more. It shouldn't be five pages of, of text. Uh, it shouldn't be, uh, you know, it should be a, a 60, a 60 slide um, uh, presentation. It should be simple, right? Um, clear clear sentence that everybody in the company can understand and of course it needs to be quantifiable um, because if your if your statement is um, we'd like to improve customer retention well yes but how much five percent sixty percent you know um, clear goals clear goals so one sentence quantifiable um, you know, you could have a business metric that makes sense, whatever you, your business is. The second question is, well, uh, machine learning is about data, right? It's it's not about, you know, will we build a model or will we not build a model? Uh, we may not need to build a model. We may reuse models. But, you know, what's the data like? Do we have enough data? Do we have any data at all? Um uh, and that's that's obviously a, an, an important fact. Um, and everybody has data. You're going to say, uh, oh, we have databases, we have backends, we have S3, we have all that good stuff. Tons of data. Right, tons of data. But is it, how good is it? You know, how relevant to the problem is it? It's not about quantity. It's about quality. It's about making it better over time, you know, curating it. Um and if you don't have enough data or don't, not enough clean data, what's the cost of getting more? Sometimes it's as easy as, you know, collecting more uh, web logs. Or sometimes it's as hard as, you know, labeling complex pictures for computer vision uh, applications. Uh, another important point is involve everybody early on. Um, it's it's not you know machine learning is is uh is too serious to be left to data scientists right to paraphrase that uh, uh, that famous uh, sentence it, it's about solving business problems so you need to have business stakeholders um, to educate them on how you're gonna build that project and what kind of results they can expect you know setting expectations you need domain experts to help you understand the problem. Sometimes, you know, it's the problem is straightforward enough that I would say engineers and developers can figure it out. But, you know, if you have complex um, problems in, I don't know, healthcare or chemistry 
or finance. You know, you could be a very strong software engineer. You don't know uh, all the all the finer points of uh, of the domain. So you definitely need help here. Of course, you're going to need IT in there to because um, they're they're going to be you know building and deploying and uh, and monitoring your apps. And of course, data science, if you have a data science team, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody around the same table trying to figure out what the problem is, what's the best question we can answer, what would be a good metric, et cetera. Uh, so here are some examples of terrible, uh, terrible uh, whiteboard sentences. Uh, this is my favorite one. And honestly, I still hear this one a lot. Um, we want to see what the technology can do for us, you know. Burp. Red flag, alarm, awful, awful. This this is guaranteed disaster uh, because you're going to be fooling around with you know software and servers and whatnot, and you're not going to build anything, right? And even if you build a POC, you know what it, what is it good for? It's it's a toy example. You need to have a good solid business problem to work on. This is my next favorite. Uh, we have tons of relational data. Surely you can do something with it. Yes, yes, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's not about the data. It's about the business question. Okay, the data is just here to help you answer the question. But what's the question in the first place? And yes, this one. I read this cool article about FUBAR ML. We ought to try it. Um, this is terrible too because... Um, you know, it's not about tools. It's not about, you know, having fun with uh, expensive toys. It's about answering business problems, okay? So if you find yourself, uh, you know, uh, getting that as, a, a, let's say, a, a, an entry point into machine learning, you know, stand your ground, say no, uh, and, and, you know, dive deeper on the problem and, and figure out what the business question is. Okay, why are we even embarking on this project? Okay, I cannot overstate how important this is. This is the number one mistake people make. Okay, so once you have, um, um, you know, a rough uh, business question, or maybe, you know, you have three or four and you're trying to evaluate which one is is the best one, um, of course, you need to define metrics. Okay, so what is the business metric showing success, right? Um, and this is important not only to show um, success to the team, you know, making progress. It's really about showing success to the company and to your business stakeholders saying, hey, you know, machine learning is actually quite good at solving this problem. We, we had a positive impact, right? Um, again, technical metrics are nice, but it's about improving business outcomes. It's also very important to understand the baseline. A lot of time you're going to be uh, improving or, or sometimes replacing an existing system, which could be human-based or which could be another IT application. So, of course, you want to do better than the existing process, and it's important to understand where you are. Okay, so what's the, uh, what's the, uh, what's the baseline you're starting from? Okay, what's working well, what's not working well, uh, that kind of stuff. Once you understand the baseline, you need to understand what's a reasonable but still significant improvement. Okay. Um, and this can widely vary, right? It, it, some, let's say you want to um, automatically classify incoming support tickets, right? Use natural language processing and assign tickets to the right support uh, representative based on what the topic is, okay? So you could say, well, you know, we have a human baseline and, uh, and um, it's, you know, it's a little bit random because people don't understand the domain very well. And, and you know, maybe we only get, I don't know, let's say 70 or 80 percent accuracy on assigning to the right team or the right, the right person. So you could say, OK, you want to do better than that, right? Like if your baseline is 80 percent, you know, 81 percent is not a reasonable improvement. Okay. It's not enough to justify launching a project. 99% uh, is not a reasonable improvement because you're not going to get to 99% uh, short term. Okay, So find something that's impactful for the company, that shows you know, 
a positive outcome, but that's still reasonable. Because as I will say again and again and again, machine learning is an iterative process and you want to keep iterating and keep improving your project and your model. So you could say, well, you know, we want to improve, uh, you know, ticket classification uh, by 5% every quarter. Okay, fine. Why not? Okay, uh, start, get some results and keep improving on that. Okay. And here again, uh, there are some red flags that that you should be mindful of. And, and you know, machine learning is it's just like every other domain. There's a lot of jargon. So it's very easy to define business or machine learning metrics that are super difficult to relate to. So for example, coming back to my support ticket cl uh, classification example, uh, you, you know, you could have your data science colleagues entering the, the office and say, oh yeah, we're super excited. The confusion metrics has significantly improved. Okay, so if you're if you're into machine learning, you know what that means. If you're a, a software engineer, it's not obvious. If you're a business person, you're completely confused and and you have no idea what they're talking about. Okay, um, is that good? Is that bad? Confusion metrics? How could be something called confusion be be good? Right? It's it's weird. And you could say, well, sorry, I didn't understand what you said. And and that person could go, oh yeah, but you know, P90 time to resolution is now under 24 hours. Like okay. Uh, is is that good? Is that bad? What what are you talking about here? And you know, then the person could say, "Oh well, don't you understand? Misclassified emails have gone down 5.3 percent using the latest model." And you say, "Ah, okay, okay. Now now I'm starting to to relate to this. Okay, uh, you know, we want to miss to we want to classify those support emails correctly. And okay, so if we do a better job, that's that's interesting." But at the end of the day, you know, what you want to hear is something like, well, you know, the latest support survey shows that very happy customers are up 9.2%. And say, ah, now that's really good because now I see business impact. And maybe that's my metric or maybe that's one of the metrics I'm, I'm keeping my eyes on. And well, you know, that's good. It's, it's what I want to see, you know, happy customers, people who get their problems solved quickly so that, you know, they can enjoy uh, the service or the product that they bought, right? And uh, we want to make customers happy. So that's good, okay? So pay attention to that. It's very easy for tech teams to come up with tech metrics that are not necessarily useless. Maybe they're telling, uh, you know, the, the right thing uh, in the sense that, yes, this is working the way it should, but is it is it telling the business story? Probably not, right? So make sure to have those metrics as well. The next one is figuring out what you need um, and, and, and what your skills are when it comes to actually building the project, okay? So it's really about assessing needs, not wants. Um, you know, I'm an engineer. I love to play with technology. I love to, uh, you know, get my hands dirty with uh, all sorts of tools. But is this the right thing to do for the project and the company? And Am I shooting myself in the foot by using tech that's really too complicated for me or or, or just over engineered for the problem? Okay. So ask yourself, you know, and you have to be super honest about this. So, okay, we understand the business problem, we understand the metrics, and can we build a data set describing the problem, right? Do we have the data? And like I said, uh, is it costly to get more if we need more? Do we have the big data or or just the data platform to quickly and efficiently, uh, you know, clean, curate that data in order to build data sets? Is it something we're good at and is this something we need for this problem, right? Um, let me give you an example. Let's say you want to do computer vision on uh, medical images, right? Detecting conditions on medical images. So this is a really specific problem, right? So it's not something that's likely to be available off the shelf. Um, and um, it's not something, for example, that uh, AWS services can do out of the box. So if you're dealing with that kind of problem, yes, you certainly need to have a data set. So you need to collect images 
from hospitals and and uh, and, and and medical sources. Uh, you need to prepare those images. You need to keep those anonymized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are so many problems, but Yes, you need to do that because it's very specific data. Now, if you want to build, let's say, a fun, uh, a fun application for, you know, maybe children, uh, where you know they, um, uh, I don't know, they upload uh, Im animal images, and and automatically you recognize what animal that is, and you give them fun facts and educational facts on animals. You know, why not? You could say, well. That's got to be available somewhere, right? That's got to be available. Why should I go and take, you know, thousands of pictures of thousands of different uh, animal species? Uh, maybe that's not necessary. So you need to understand how specific the problem is, how readily available data could be for that, and and uh, and what what it would look like on your end to work with that data, and how much work would be would be involved. Once you kind of you know get a sense of, of the data that you need or don't need, um, you need to ask yourself: Can can we write and can we tune machine learning algorithms? Is this something we know how to do? Uh, is this something we should be doing for that problem? And again, it's not about oh we want to do it because it's fun and it's going to look like it's going to look right on my resume, right? Please don't do that. What's going to look right on your resume is delivering projects that create business value, right? Uh, you could have a long list of technologies, but if you never had a successful project, you know, I don't think it looks good. It's about showing business impact, right? So do you have to do it, right? Again, if you want to recognize everyday life images, if you want to do sentiment analysis on everyday natural language, um, do you really think it's, it's worth writing your own algo? Right, it's, those problems are already solved in a way, and there should be limited machine learning work here. Now, if you want to do, um, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, complex image processing on um, industrial uh, um, parts, you know, mechanical parts, or I don't know, semiconductor wafers and that kind of stuff, or satellite images, you know. Yes, maybe, maybe here you need to uh, actually go and, and build a custom solution. But again, be, be, you know, be critical, do your homework, do your research, see if those problems have been solved before, and, and try to find the quickest route to success. And of course, infrastructure, right? Because you know, data, training models, deploying models, all that will require infrastructure. Uh, do you need to do it? Do you want to do it? No, you don't want to do it, right? Trust me, you don't want to do it. You want to focus on the business problem. You want to focus on the machine learning problem. You don't want to manage servers, right? No, I mean, no company ever ever won any any customers because they have the best run Docker cluster or 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 uh, you know the 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 most amazing EC2 instances. Okay, it's it's not about that. Of course, it needs to run, it needs to scale, it needs to be fast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, it's not the core problem here. The core problem is understanding data to answer the business question, and then building a model that does that right. Okay, infrastructure not so much. So it's a whole it's it's a whole spectrum of solutions. So on the left, you could say, well, you know, I, I need a fully managed solution. Okay, I think my problem is, um, let's say, generic enough, and I mean that in a positive way. You know, it's 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 a it's a well understood problem. It's been solved before. Uh, I can probably find off the shelf uh, APIs to to do that, or off the shelf models, uh, and definitely I shouldn't be managing infrastructure. Okay, and at the on the right hand. Uh, maybe you have a crazy, you know, innovative and 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 totally new problem that you're trying to solve. So probably you need your data set. Probably you need algorithms, um, right? And 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 so you need to find that balance. Okay, you need to find that balance. Be super super honest about what the business needs are, uh, and and then what the technical needs are. And, and match that with your skills, okay? 
So once you know that, then you need to pick the best tool for the job, which is obvious. And uh, well, if you've, uh, if you, I'm sure you've seen this before, uh, it used to be called the Iron Triangle of Project Management. Um, and here's my version for for machine learning. And um, you know, cost, time to market, or accuracy, you get to pick two, right? So for example, if you want uh, a cost-effective uh, and a fast option, it's probably not going to be the most accurate, okay? If you want to go fast, build your POC, show some business value to your stakeholders early on, um, then then you need to do that, right? Um, and that's okay. Maybe it's enough to get started, um, but maybe it's not good enough for production. But at least you can discover the problem, learn more about the problem, okay? Uh, one important thing to know is that improving accuracy will take increasingly more time and money, right? It's really about diminishing returns. So typically, you know, it's reasonably easy to get 80% accuracy. Um, it's going to be more work to get to 90%. It's going to get a lot of work to get to 95 And anything beyond that, you know, every every decimal after that is going to be increasingly, increasingly difficult and expensive in uh uh, generally, so it's really diminishing returns because for some problems will not require, um, you know, 99 accuracy, 99 percent accuracy. Um, you know, especially when you look at the, the 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 associated costs of getting there. So it's about again understanding when to stop and you know when it stops making sense to improve um, the accuracy, right, uh, with respect to the amount of time and resources that need to be uh, that need to be um, uh, invested in there. Okay, and you know it's it's a gray line. It's not obvious that oh 91.9 percent is where I should stop. You need to figure it out, right? You need to figure it out. Um, and another another problem that I see sometimes is people get a super super excited about state of the art. Uh, and you know they read the blog posts and sometimes they read the research papers and and it's like oh we can use this it's it's amazing and this crazy new model from whoever and you know I I, I would you know give you a word of caution here because you know state of the art is amazing for sure but it's it's hard to work with it's hard to understand it can be you know complex and costly to to tune and 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 and, and live with so. I would only focus on what I call the actionable state of the art. <laughs> what I mean by actionable is stuff that you can really use um, yourself on a daily basis, right? So techniques like transfer learning with pre-trained models, uh, AutoML, um, these are, I would say, reasonable and actionable uh, tools. I would be a little wary uh, of the super crazy fancy uh, models that you see out there. Um, they're probably overkill and they're probably too complicated to to work with unless you really really have very strong uh, machine learning and data science skills and as I mentioned earlier um, best practices are critical so things are not different this time okay uh, I'll take this one to the grave uh, AI ML is software engineering um, and it's not something that lives in a you know in an ivory tower or a dungeon where you know it's a totally different world and none of the best practices uh, ever apply uh, i think this is yeah, unfortunately i still hear, hear this one a lot although it's it's been improving lately i have to say uh, probably because also more developers get into machine learning and they bring in all the all the knowledge and the best practices that they've learned over time so you know, dev environment, test environments, uh, QA, documentation, uh, agile methods, versioning, et cetera, et cetera. So all the good things that help deliver high quality projects need to apply here. It's not okay, in my opinion, to say, oh, well, give me the data and I'll, I'll talk to you in six months and, uh, and maybe I will have a model. And, and then even if they do, right, you get that, black box model and, and you have no idea it really works and you know if you're lucky you're going to get some results and say oh look you know on, on my test set this performs very well it's like yeah what about real life data you know 
So uh, it can't work like that, in my opinion. Um, you need to standardize workflows. Um, a, machine learning is, is still a fairly new field. There are lots of different tools, lots of different ways to, to build models, deploy models, etc. And standardizing as you go, as your ML practice grows, is really important. Just like we've standardized our, de our development workflows over time. And again, onboard all teams. Uh, this is not just about data science and, and, and machine learning. It's about embedding the models into your IT applications, deploying them, monitoring them, um, measuring their business impact, et cetera, et cetera. It's really about you know, the IT in general and not just data science. And a, a very important thing is, again, a lot of Machine learning projects tend to be, you know, tested in sandboxes or, you know, like I said, with test data sets or, or A-B testing, etc. And it's all good. You need that. Okay, it's it's a it's an important starting point. But truth is in production, right? And coming back to Jaws, right? This this is what I'm talking about. Uh, well, this is shark, you know, hunting production. And this barrel ID might have looked good in, you know, on paper or, or in the harbor. But when you're in the ocean and you actually start testing it, you know, how did that go? Um, not so well. So same thing for machine learning models. You need to get them in production early on, as soon as you can, honestly, and, and as often as needed, because you need to evaluate those models on um, real life data, right? You need to see how they perform on real life data, and real life data is always going to look different um, than than the data that you have in your training and 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 test data sets. You know that, that's just how it is. You know, real life data is never clean, is never exactly right, and uh, and there are so many things that can go wrong. And, and you can, you need to figure them out um, as early and as often as needed to keep your models operating at high quality. So in order to do that, of course, you need continuous integration, continuous deployment, you need automation. Um, as, as soon as you can start building those, there will be you know, a welcome addition. And generally, all the DevOps practices for, for machine learning are good. And if people want to call that ML ops, that's okay. But honestly, it's really DevOps uh, and uh, all over again, right? So if you've done that before, um, good. If you're a, if you're a DevOps engineer, um, you have a, a a very very nice career path into ML, right? Just learn how to deploy machine learning models and how to monitor them, and 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 you can transition into ML very easily. ML ops is is a super super hot topic right now because um, yeah, I guess it's still very new and people realize how important it is to get that stuff right. And Hey, uh, yes. Can uh, yeah. I, uh, can can we get one uh, poll uh, going? Uh, oh so yes, that, of course. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Aditya, can you bring in the uh, poll now, uh, folks? So uh, we, we we will wait for 20 seconds for you all to respond to this poll, uh, and then Julian will continue post this call. That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's difficult. It, it, yeah, and it is a difficult one. It is a difficult one because you want to tick all the boxes, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you yeah, ask your yeah. boss, you know, if you if you give that poll to your stakeholders, they will tick all the boxes. We want all of that. And then it's your it's your job to say, well, I'm sorry, my friends, but you know, it's not that easy. I wish we could do that. And over time, you know, you learn how to get better and and how to do yeah, better yeah. on those three things. But early on, you know, you you have to pick your uh, you have to pick your uh, yeah. Uh, that, that was precisely the reason why we thought about this uh, particular poll because uh, what we have learned uh, working with customers across the globe is that uh, for, from use case to use case, answer to this question will differ or rather it should differ. You cannot have a org level answer for this question. It has yes. to be at the use case level. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's the intent. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. So that's why, you know, there are no hard rules here because if you were, you know, coming back to my healthcare example, if you're trying to detect... I don't know, let's say you want to do early cancer detection. Um, accuracy is paramount, of course. Uh, 
Um, you know, it's, yeah. you don't want to tell people, oh, you're, you know, you have a high chance of having cancer if they're perfectly okay. And, and I guess it's even worse to tell someone, oh, you're absolutely fine. And, and then that person, uh, you know, is actually, is actually ill. So, uh, yeah, when you have life critical scenarios, um, I guess autonomous driving, healthcare. Um, yeah, it, in fact, in the current it, it, situation, uh, how quick the vaccine can reach to, yes, the, uh, yes. to the healthcare center, yeah. time to market is very important. Yeah, right? exactly. Uh, it's, sometimes you have, uh, or, or maybe it's you know startups. You know, uh, there's we know there's a first mover advantage for for startups in new markets. Uh, so you could say, well, you know, I want to deploy something, you know, next month because I know I know we have competition and we want to move faster. We want to collect customer feedback faster. Um, and, and time to market is, is super important and, and accuracy is not so important in the short term. Yeah, so again, this is why, you know, yeah. those questions, it, generally, you know, I'm very wary when people come with pre-built answers to everything. Uh, that's that's why I much prefer to, to give people, um, you know, help them realize what the questions are, what they should be looking at, and, and then they come up with the answer that's right for them. They know their business. I don't, right? So um, it's yeah. very, you know, just you have to be very humble here and, and help people understand what they should be thinking about. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So yeah, we still have, yeah, okay. So a lot of people think accuracy is the most important. Of course, I would agree, right? No one wants to build, uh, you know, no one wants to build uh, models that don't predict right. So that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. But Again, as you iterate, those things could differ, right? You could say initially we want time to market, first few iterations, and then, then we want to work on accuracy a little more. Yeah, so makes sense. Okay, so the last uh, thing is really how once you've got uh, all those things figured out, how do you, um, how do you uh, go and deal with the project and Iterate, 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 iterate. Okay. Also known as Boyd's Law, not new, 1960. Even I wasn't born. Uh, and it's about you know speed iter of iteration beating quality of iteration, which is a shocking, shocking statement for uh, software engineers uh, who are you know heavily invested in code quality <laughs> and they should. But yeah, you know it's important. It's important to move fast and learn fast about the problem. So the best advice I can give you is start small. Don't go for moonshots. You know, it's very tempting to say, oh, we want to build this crazy complicated model because we want to solve this crazy complicated business question. I mean, especially if your organization is new to ML, start with something reasonable, okay? Not toy examples, okay? Not what I said. You can run the toy examples, that's okay, but then find uh, uh, maybe five to 10 uh, small, interesting projects inside your organization where, you know, you could show some improvement uh, and, and build your machine learning practice, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The, uh, the, the, the analogy that I take is, you know, your company, your organization is like a, is, is like a huge engine. Okay. Imagine a, a cruise ship engine. It's a huge thing. So, you could say, oh, we're going to build the next new engine and from scratch, and it's going to be amazing. And yeah, probably. But I think before you do that, you need to understand how the engine, existing engine works and where you could improve it, right? So I'm sure you could find you know, five to 10 particular spots where a little bit of extra oil, a little bit of a, you know, a screwdriver action <laughs> or wrench action, can improve things, okay? And when you start thinking all those small inefficiencies, when you start plugging all those tiny leaks, then the engine as a whole run much smoother. And I think this is a good way to look at machine learning. What are in your organizations the the small things that drag you down, the manual processes that waste your time, um, the legacy IT processes that are, you know, outdated because they use rigid business rules instead of using prediction, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So start with continuous improvement, uh, small things, processes that are well understood, but that you think you can make better with predictive models. Okay. And 
in the same vein, you should try the simple things first. Um, don't rush to complex deep learning models. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about 80% of machine learning models out there are, you know, regression models or classification models built with uh, well understood um, uh, machine learning algorithms. So be super pragmatic, right? Start with the well understood algorithms. Uh, you know, uh, libraries like scikit-learn, um, uh, XJBoost, linear regression, uh, etc. The 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 ones that are easy to understand, easy to tune, very inexpensive to train, etc. etc. Okay. And if that's not enough, or if your business problem is complex enough, then yeah, you can start fooling around with uh, deep learning models, etc. Of course, for computer vision, natural language processing, it's it's important to to do that. But even there, you know, uh, don't go and st start writing your neural uh, network architecture. It's it's honestly not needed. 99.99% of the time, you can start with pre-trained models um, and um, maybe use them as is, or maybe fine tune them on your own data. Uh, but you know, again, simple, simple, simple. Keep it simple, right? Um, simple usually wins. As mentioned before, go to production quickly. Okay, once you have some accuracy that's you know interesting enough, start testing that on data. Okay, run A/B tests uh, or run tests on you know capture uh, real life data and 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 inject it in your model see what happens see if your assumptions were right see what's not predicted right um, talk to the domain experts ask them to look at the data and ask them how they would have predicted it um, so is you know is uh, everybody wrong about this or uh, would a domain expert uh, get it right and uh, and then why did the model get it wrong you know are you missing uh, features in your data set or you know understand the, the the prediction errors that's super important to do this on on a regular basis right so observe prediction errors and then decide you know do you need to uh, fix the data set so maybe you need more columns maybe there's a feature missing here and that yeah that domain experts can point you to say oh yeah you know uh, this is missing in your data you know that particular information is missing and uh, and this is probably why we got the model got it wrong do you need more data uh, it's it's a fascinating discussion you know how much data is needed for machine learning so depending on the problem you know it could be a few thousand samples to a few million samples um, so you need to you need to adjust for that maybe you need to tweak the algo right maybe you have the right algo but maybe the parameters that are used for training are are not the best so there's this whole discussion on you know uh, model tuning um, that's uh, that can help or maybe you should try another algo maybe you know maybe you want to think outside of the box and, and say okay yeah we've you know we've tried I don't know we've tried XJ boost and it did reasonably well but we think you know maybe maybe we could try uh, deep learning here simple deep learning and see how it does on, on that data okay it's it's in constant flux that's the thing you know new algos come up all the time new IDs come up all the time so um, you need to challenge your assumptions uh, and, and look at prediction errors and see how to fix them. And repeat until accuracy gains become irrelevant. Okay, irrelevant here meaning um, irrelevant to the business problem uh, and with respect to uh, the costs that would be involved in, in improving the model again. Okay. And then you can move to the next project, right? Job done. And uh, and you can start you can start churning those models and and pr and then become a a, a well-oiled machine learning team. And to prove my point that machine learning is an iterative process, you know, uh, here's a typical machine learning cycle uh, life cycle, and it kind of shows some of the things we've been talking about. So start from the business problem. That's the starting point. Get that thing right. Okay, nail it down. Otherwise, you'll be, you'll be, you know, running in circles in the desert, and uh, and you're going to be frustrated. So frame the problem. How do we use data to answer the problem? What what do the domain experts tell us? Do we have that data in house? Um, do we have enough of it? And then 
start to collect it, start to centralize it in um, in in a central in a central place, clean it, prepare it, visualize it. Okay, typically what data scientists do, and and then engineer features. Okay, so transform the data to make it more expressive, to make it easier for algorithms to learn, and then train models and tune parameters to get to high accuracy and measure accuracy and probably early on you know accuracy is not good enough and business goals are not met and so you need to you know go back to square one so to speak and 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 you know figure out what to improve to to get to the yes <laughs> path and once you get to the yes path then you move on to deploying models and serving predictions and monitoring um, all of that and over time retraining to account for new data right so you can see it's you have multiple cycles in there uh, so iterate 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 and you also need plenty of different skills right from business stakeholders to your domain experts to your data engineering and, and data science teams to machine learning engineers to help you optimize uh, the, the the machine learning performance and the technical performance of your models, and of course IT to help you deploy and monitor um, everything. Right, so iterative cross uh, cross team effort. Okay, if you if you think like that, uh, you're already on the right path. So I guess the the next question is, does this work? Right. Um, yeah. So, and why am I even talking to you? So. Machine learning, Amazon has been doing machine learning for a while, so uh, a while meaning 20 plus years. And here are some, you know, fun numbers. Uh, so recommendation on Amazon.com and other local websites is uh, is important, um, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, we estimate that about 30% of uh, page views on Amazon.com come from um, recommendation. Um, and obviously, all the logistics uh, could not run without uh, automation and without machine learning. Um, you're certainly familiar with um, the Echo devices and Alexa. And of course, those use uh, natural language processing techniques and deep learning techniques. And uh, Prime Air uh, also, uh, also uses machine learning and computer vision and, and other techniques, right? for drone deliveries so you know we've been doing this almost since day one and over time we've built a lot of uh, best practices and tools to to be successful with machine learning uh, and this translates into uh, the aws machine learning stack uh, and don't worry we're not going to go through uh, we're not going to go through all of this uh, the key takeaway here is we think of our stack as you know three layers the top one ai services is the easiest uh, quickest one to use because uh, most of these services are based on uh, models that we trained on very large data sets and we keep training them and optimizing them and uh, and we expose those capabilities through apis just like everything in aws so for example recognition will let you analyze images and videos uh, you know, object detection, uh, uh, face detection, face comparison, uh, content moderation, et cetera, et cetera. Pass the image to the API um, to get the job done, right, in, in real time. Uh, super, super simple. You, you, can, you can test it in the AWS console or you can call the API and I can guarantee even a, a, a junior developer can work with this in 10 minutes. Uh, likewise, we have speech services for speech to text, text to speech. Uh, we have natural language uh, services like Comprehend for sentiment analysis and entity extraction, you know, translate for translation, text tract for uh, uh, document processing, OCR, etc. I'm not going to go through the list, but you can go and, and take a look at those. And again, generally, the, uh, the common theme here is we train the model we optimize the model uh, you call an api get the job done okay and and a lot of those again you can start using literally in minutes um, and and it's going to be one line of code most of the time so super super simple zero machine learning skills required 
Um, and, and this is again the quickest, simplest way into machine learning. If you just if you want the no nonsense stuff in your app to do um, to solve common uh, machine learning use cases, this is the place to start. And even if you have a bigger project, there are certainly chunks of the project that could be done with AI services, and then you could focus your actual machine learning efforts on smaller chunks, right? So if you need to do translation or if you need to do text to speech, you know, within your project, go, go and do that with uh, Poly and uh, and translate, okay? And then the rest of the of the problem that is more specific, you can address with SageMaker, and which is the next layer down, where you can bring your own machine learning code, uh, whether it's you know TensorFlow or PyTorch or or Scikit-Learn or your own custom code, it doesn't even it doesn't even have to be Python code. It could be R. It could be something else, and um, and you have full control over the the machine learning uh, lifecycle, uh, all the way from you know uh, labeling data, preparing data sets, uh, to uh, uh, feature engineering, to training, to optimizing, to deploying, etc. There are long list of capabilities here and uh, and uh, all are integrated in SageMaker Studio which is our web-based machine learning IDE. So here it's more you know uh, it, it's about bringing your code and then using SageMaker to train models and deploy models without ever managing infrastructure. All infrastructure is fully managed so it's really a one line uh, one line of code to train, one line of code to deploy um, um, regardless of the scale. Okay, so cool because cool stuff because you can focus on ML and ignore infrastructure. And at the at the bottom layer, we have um, uh, foundational uh, building blocks uh, like uh, optimized versions of the machine learning frameworks uh, available as uh, Amazon machine images for virtual machines or containers. And of course, we have the full. Uh, collection of EC2 instances, you know, CPU, GPU, and, and a few more exotic options for customers who want to build everything uh, themselves. And that's okay in some cases, it, it, it is the better option. Okay, so three layers. Um, and again, um, a, a large project could literally, you know, cherry pick from the three layers and, uh, and you know, pick the right tool for the job, right? So don't think of those layers as you know totally uh, uh, separate. They're actually complementary. So we have over 100,000 customers who use machine learning on AWS. Uh, and uh, so if your question is who's the typical customer, it's it's everybody. <laughs> uh, you know, large enterprise uh, startups, um, NGOs, universities, um, everybody. Okay, and and across all industry segments, um, of course, you know historically some some segments like retail or maybe financial services have adopted machine learning uh, quicker because they had lots of data and they had a um, a very clear business incentive to to use data for prediction. But honestly, now it's everybody, you know, healthcare industry, education, media and entertainment, telecom, uh, the list goes on, right? The list goes on. It's literally everybody. So looking at common machine learning use cases, right? Helping you, because um, hopefully by now you're a little bit excited about machine learning. And a, a question that I get sometimes is, you know, where should I start? Why sh what should I look for, you know? You're telling me five, five to 10 projects, you know, try to identify, to identify five to 10 projects. What, what are people doing uh, typically? And maybe I can start there. So that's a great way to, to get started. And we can find maybe three big chunks, which are improving the customer experience. Um, so personalizing content is super important. Uh, improving uh, customer relationship, uh, especially in contact centers. Um, that's, that's a good one as well. It's a problem that a lot of uh, company have. Um, Extracting insights from uh, media, whether it's uh, um, images or videos or documents, um, you know, extracting stuff and, and, and building high level insights. Okay, so this is a strong theme here. Uh, the second theme is, of course, make the business run smoother, right? Coming back to my 
a cruise ship, uh, you know, put oil and wrench, <laughs> wrench around in, at the right spots to make the engine run better, faster, you know, um, uh, leaner, et cetera, et cetera. So things like intelligent search, improving search capabilities, it, whether internally or, or for your own customers, processing documents, right? All companies have documents, uh, uh, you know, where we have mountains of uh, forms and, and PDF files and, and whatnot laying around and, and we need to extract the data there. Fraud detection is, is super important. Uh, as soon as you do online transactions, you want to do that. And analyzing metrics, forecasting, you know, uh, whether it's supply chain or whether it's inventory or whether it's business met um, financial metrics, forecasting is important. And then, you know, innovation, uh, building new crazy applications that are powered by machine learning. So I would say machine learning in general, and specifically, uh, there are some interesting developments uh, in, in DevOps. Um, uh, we have services, for example, that automatically review code um, and, and uh, you know, give you a friendly tap on the shoulder saying, hmm, you should look at this code because I think something is not right. Um, so lots of different ideas here. And maybe let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, so media intelligence, is, again, is, is a popular one where um, our customers want to extract insights from images and, and videos um, and, and, or add insights to that, uh, to that content. So for example, um, you can use recognition on images and videos uh, to, um, uh, like I said, do object detection or, uh, or, or face recognition, you know, matching, uh, matching uh, uh, people in the, in the video to, to names, extracting metadata, um, and, and then storing that metadata later on, right? For example, you, if you're a news channel, you could want, you know, you, you may want to index all your all your video files that way, so that now you can easily answer questions like, uh, um, "Show me a video uh, with you know the prime minister of India and the French president, right?" And instead of having to do that stuff manually, you know, watching hours and hours and hours of videos and then entering that data somewhere, uh, you can ask recognition to do that. Okay. Um, and that's just that's just an example. Uh, you can do uh, you can extract the audio part of your videos and use Amazon Transcribe to transcribe it to text. Okay, so that would be speech to text. And if you want to do captioning, for example, or if you want just to have um, a text transcript of the video because you want to run text analytics on that, and then you can use Translate obviously to translate those. Uh, um, uh, those texts into your own local language, right? Uh, because maybe you want to do uh, captioning in a different language, okay? And you could run Amazon Comprehend on that to do, again, entity extraction, um, figuring out which locations are mentioned, which uh, uh, personalities are mentioned, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you can see, you know, you can automate all of that. And now you can ask questions on, you know, show me show me uh, uh, the list of videos with the prime minister of India, the French president, uh, where they talk about, uh, you know, I don't know, global warming, right? And imagine having to do that manually at scale on thousands of hours of video it's a donking task now you can automate all of that store those um, insights into your database and query very simply uh, and get results in, in seconds okay well just one id but there are so many combinations here another important example is document processing like i said <laughs> a lot of companies well all companies really have lots of documents that they need to process, you know, financial documents, contracts, uh, customer documents, you know, credit applications, mortgage applications. No, the list is endless. So, and, and still a lot of companies use, uh, you know, paper documents. So you can digitize that. You can run uh, Amazon Text Tract 
um, which is our OCR service to extract the text, to extract um, tables and forms. It's not just the raw text, it also it's also the structure of the text, which is really important if you have a form. You don't care so much about the text in there. You want to know that this box was ticked and this field contains this particular string. So it's about the text, it's about the structure too. And then again, you can run translate, you can run comprehend, you can you can combine uh, you can combine all those services. They work very easily together because again, it's really one line of code every time. So you can you know take the output of one and feed it to the next and build super smart workflows, right? Um, and you can also add um, another service called Amazon Augmented AI to the mix. Because, you know, of course we recognize that a lot of business processes need to be as accurate as possible. And as mentioned before, there are diminishing returns on the machine learning side. So maybe the machine learning part of this process is let's say 92% accurate. But the 8% left are important, right? You don't want your mortgage applications or your credit applications to be to be uh, botched. Uh, so you could say, well, if if the machine learning confidence score is lower than let's say 90%, um, right? So the service tells you, yeah, 90, you know, 89% sure this is pretty correct. <laughs> this is correct. Uh, well, you could say, well, that's not good enough, and I'm going to uh, automatically send that to a human team for review, right? So the, oh, hopefully the bulk of the processing can be automated away, and, and you can uh, send the rest to a human team to get to hopefully 100% accuracy, even though even humans make mistakes. But you can get very, very close to that. And this is a service called Amazon Augmented AI that lets you automatically build a workflow where uh, I would say lower confidence predictions are automatically dealt with by a human team, right? So you get the best of both worlds in a way. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is, um, of course, um, once you uh, walk into machine learning per se, where you bring your own data and um, and start to investigate, uh, I would say, more specific use cases, there, there's a world of opportunities. Uh, so these are the common ones. Uh, predictive maintenance is, is uh, super important in, in the industry, in the manufacturing industry, um, trying to anticipate uh, uh, failures um, so that you, know, you fix them before they happen and you minimize downtime. Forecasting, uh, every single organization has a time series data, uh, whether it's, you know, sales or, or again, uh, inventory or, or financial metrics. And you want, to, you want to figure out what the future could look like. Fraud detection is, again, paramount as soon as you're online. Um, credit, uh, credit risk, uh, credit decisions are, uh, again, highly important for uh, financial services and retail. Document processing, document extraction. You know, sometimes uh, documents are so specific that, uh, um, you know, you can't really use Textract on them. You have to go deeper uh, and, and, uh, and train models on very particular vocabularies or very particular documents. Computer vision is huge, <laughs> right? Uh, healthcare, manufacturing, media and entertainment, like we said a few minutes ago, autonomous driving is increasingly important and it's, it's extremely hard to build. Uh, as you can imagine, needs to be very accurate and very fast. Recommendation, personalization, you know, building uh, uh, personal content. And churn prediction is, is important across industries, figuring out when customers may stop using your service, right? So these are common ones, but you know, again, the list is is really endless. Uh, I just selected two examples uh, to give you uh, to give you a sense of uh, of what people uh, build here. So I figured, you know, Coinbase, uh, they're they've been in the news, <laughs> and uh, and they they use uh, SageMaker, so they build their own models for uh, fraud detection. And the the particular use case they're they're working on is uh, authentic authenticating 
IT documents because they found out that uh, crooks will actually try to open many different accounts uh, using the same uh, photo, right? The same picture on uh, you know forged IG documents. So it's not about recognizing who that person is. It's about recognizing that this face is extremely similar to another face that we've already seen on another document. Okay, so not not a not a very easy problem, but of of course very important for them as they want to cut down on the on fake accounts and forged accounts. And so they use SageMaker to do that. Um, so computer vision problem, um, pretty pretty sophisticated model. And as SageMaker lets you uh, work with managed infrastructure, you know you literally are uh, standing on the shoulders of uh, of AWS infrastructure uh, all the time. You can scale um, unlimited. And so if you need very large training clusters. Uh, you you can get them and you can get them literally in one line of code and so they were able to train um, in only 10 minutes uh, compared to 20 hours before so this increased agility lets you retrain literally all the time so you could you could train multiple times per day and you could detect fraud very very quickly you could say well okay this face you know this face we've seen before and 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 given the volume of new accounts that they have, I'm sure they need to retrain very, very regularly, and they can do this you know, cost effectively and, and quickly on SageMaker. And well, this is certainly a company you're, uh, you've heard about, uh, PayU, uh, one of the top uh, payment gateways in uh, in India, growing very fast with lots of customers. And here they use SageMaker for credit scoring. Uh, so based on uh, customer information, they have a, a custom model to decide uh, whether they should give credit uh, to customers who do not have uh, credit uh, ratings, uh, card or bank accounts. So a very, very interesting use case. Again, credit, uh, credit risk, credit decisions are uh, pr probably one of the top use cases for, for financial services. And, uh, and they've been successful here on, the, on SageMaker, right? So just two examples, but um, you know, we have lots more. I'll, I'll point you to uh, this URL, which is easy enough to remember, uh, ml.aws. And this is really where you can find information on all the services in the stack. And I guess more important than services you can find uh, all the customer references and um, and across all different industry segments, and uh, and I'm sure you can find something that you can relate to and that can inspire you to to get started, and hopefully with those uh, guidelines, uh, you you know you know now which questions you should be working on, and and you can get on the right track. Okay, uh, so. Uh, We'll have a little time for uh, for questions. Uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, for tuning in and and joining me today. Uh, if you want to stay in touch, you can find me easily, <laughs> you know, on LinkedIn and Twitter and Medium, and uh, I have uh, quite a few uh, videos on YouTube as well. Uh, if you want to dive deeper into uh, into our services and particularly SageMaker. So thank you very much. Thank you to my colleagues for inviting me and, uh, and organizing this. It's been a pleasure. So uh, let's see if we have questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Julian, we, we do have questions. Uh, okay. So while we discuss on the question, uh, I'll, I'll request Aditya to put in uh, the poll on the, on the, uh, sure. on the screen. Yeah, uh, so, so Julian, uh, the interesting question, what I want to discuss with you, and I thought instead of writing it uh, and answering in textual manner, we should be discussing this, uh, is about uh, how do we go about doing predictive maintenance uh, for plant equipments on AWS? Uh, okay. So uh, if you could share some insights uh, how, how uh, people should go about doing predictive maintenance at a plant level. Okay. Yes, it's um, it's it's a very you know I really like predictive maintenance because the the outcome is extremely clear. You know, if you do a good job <laughs> on predictive maintenance, you know, you minimize downtime, you you fix problems before they happen, and you avoid uh, you know very severe breakdowns that are likely to. 
take place at the worst possible time. So it, it's a very good use case because it, it again, uh, it's very clear what the improvement is. Um, and so there are there are different ways to do it. Um, and again, I should follow my own advice. So we should start simple, okay? And as a matter of fact, uh, we've built uh, specific AWS services in the AI services layer. Okay, remember the that top layer. Um, let me show that again. Yeah, no. Oh, here it is. So you see uh, uh, on the right hand side, there's a thing called industrial and it says Monitron. And this is a, a fully managed service for uh, that helps you build predictive maintenance applications. And actually, um, this service includes the the sensors that you uh, that you can put on your equipment. Okay, so let's say you want to monitor, uh, you know, motors or pumps, you know, rotating equipment, that kind of thing. All you have to do is buy some sensors, and they're you know, pretty small. They're smaller than a a pack of cigarettes, and um, and you attach them to your equipment. You uh, associate them to uh, to the Monitron gateway, which is a small uh, Wi-Fi gateway. Uh, the the sensors talk to the gateway using Bluetooth, and the gateway talks to the AWS cloud with uh, Wi-Fi. So you associate those things really quickly, literally take minutes, and immediately those sensors start capturing temperature and vibration information that they send to the gateway and that the gateway sends to AWS where the data is analyzed and models are trained to uh, to figure out uh, you know anomalies and send you alerts um, on um, on uh, a possible problem developing with this particular equipment and it's all integrated in a mobile app so you know it's very easy to um, to deploy it's very easy to use in the field because you get all the information there you don't even need a, a, a laptop for that so that's a super easy way to get started right. One one angle. Now you could say, well, that's that's good, but you know, I have my own sensors, or I want to build my own sensors. Okay, maybe I want more than temperature and vibration, um, and that's okay. Uh, we have another service which is called Lookout for Equipment. Okay, and here you can push data coming from your your own sensors to a cloud a cloud based service. That's going to do pretty much the same thing, right? Analyze the data coming from the sensors and building models and alerting on possible problems. Okay, so you could. Now that's another way to do it, and it's generally targeted at the same category of of uh, equipment. So you know, motors and pumps and gears and and that, all that stuff. Now you could say, well, that's all good, but um, I actually do not want to monitor uh, gears and and uh, and motors. I want to do um, I want to do predictive maintenance for I don't know aircraft engines or uh, you know other pieces of equipment, and so I have my own sensors, I have my own data, uh, and um, then you know you can move one level down and move to SageMaker, and then start using either off-the-shelf anomaly detection um, algorithms or your own models if you've built that, and train uh, again without worrying about infrastructure, without worrying about scale, and that train and optimize and deploy those models on SageMaker. So I, I, as I mentioned before, you, whatever your problem is, I think you, you know, I would really recommend that you look at it that way. You know, um, see if there's a, an AI service that, that you can get started with, um, and, or, or if, pieces of your projects can be solved very quickly with AI services and then, you know, divide and conquer, so to speak, right? So split your project into smaller problems, solve as many as you can with AI services because you will save so much time with, with that uh, and they're really cost effective too. And then, you know, the, the, the smaller problem, but the harder problem, the more specific problem you can work on in SageMaker. Okay, and this applies to predictive maintenance, but you could say the same for, you know, computer vision, natural language processing, and other problems. Uh, 
Perfect. Uh, that that makes uh, re real sense. Uh, and uh, what what I uh, wanted to also highlight is that uh, uh, predictive maintenance as a problem is something uh, you will have different nuances depending upon the kind kind of uh, uh, equipments which you have. Right. Uh, so uh, within your organization also, you might have to have a, a multiple strategies uh, from a predictive maintenance perspective when you talk when you come to actual ML model building. Right. Well, well, you will have one strategy which talks about predictive maintenance at the org level, and then when you you are deep dive, uh, you will have to define a strategy at the equipment level, individual equipment level, and that is where uh, what kind of a data you are getting from the OEMs of those uh, uh, equipments. Yep. Plus. Uh, if you're not getting the data, then uh, then you might also have to look at uh, thinking about putting up an IoT layer before you actually go about uh, running anything from an ML perspective, right? Because again, right to maintenance, the classical case of garbage in, garbage out. Uh, if you don't get the right data, <laughs> then uh, the predictive maintenance uh, will will not give you the right uh, outcome what you're trying to do. Uh, so Julian, uh, in interest of time, I want to take one one last uh, sure. question. Uh, uh, the the question uh, what uh, I'm seeing from many folks is that uh, from a data perspective, we have a lot of uh, services uh, which will enable the organization to collect the data from different formats, uh, from different equipment, and otherwise also. Uh, once uh, there's uh, accumulation of all this data done, right? Uh, what is the best uh, way uh, leveraging ML to mine that data or to search uh, for the uh, uh, the uh, the important parameters or the correlations within that data? Right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, can you talk about uh, something on that in that lens? Yeah, that's a very good question, and yeah, it's it's a popular one. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. Over time, we've built quite a few data services. You know, the, the big data uh, portfolio is uh, is pretty um, extensive on on AWS. And I think at the end of the day, it, it I would say it comes down to uh, you know technical preference. Uh, so. If you're, you know, if you love, uh, if your organization, if your team is 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 uh, fond of of uh, let's say Spark, right, which is a very very popular tool to uh, to clean and, and prepare data, then then go and use that. Um, you know, you, it's it's about you know maybe what you're already using today. Are you already using maybe you know uh, e EMR uh, clusters for for analytics, um, or, or are you already using maybe Glue, which is our uh, ETL service, again, for uh, other workflows? Um, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You, like I said, you have to assess the tools that you know, the skills that you have, and build on that. So if your team is good at uh, writing Spark code, then, you know, EMR is a good option. Uh, you can you can run your EMR clusters and do data preparation on there. Uh, if you want a fully managed option, you can pretty much do the same on Glue. Okay, you can uh, you can bring your Spark scripts on Glue and and pull data from the data catalog data catalog from the different backends and and process it on managed infrastructure and then you know write it back to to S3 and and start from there. Um, you you can use you know uh, if you want to use Athena you know if you work with uh, if you work with uh, data that's hosted in S3 you know you, let's say you have lots of logs or uh, you know you've exported your uh, relational uh, data to to S3 as well Athena is a is a super good way to to um, to do that you know so and maybe it's a combination you know again I, I I don't think a single service will do everything that you need I think it's better to use the right tool for the job and 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 you know combine tools. Now, focusing on SageMaker, uh, there's actually a capability in SageMaker called SageMaker Processing, which lets you run uh, batch jobs uh, on managed infrastructure. Okay, again, very simple, couple of lines of code, and you can bring your own code in Python and PySpark. And you can, if you use PySpark, you can actually do distributed processing automatically. So this is really the simplest option because you don't need to build EMR clusters, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then you can, you know, you can apply your uh, feature engineering code, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's, again, 
there are there are different ways to do this, uh, and you know you can run Jupyter notebooks connected to an EMR cluster for interactive exploration. So these are probably the three things I would look at. You know, EMR, EMR, and Spark. Uh, if that's your technical culture, your technical preference, um, Glue. If you want to have you know really completely automated uh, end-to-end processing workflows, you know, unattended unattended workflows. And and SageMaker processing, if you prefer to do that within the SageMaker environment, because down the line, you want to automate that um, workflow completely, you know, data preparation, training, deploying on SageMaker. And we have a, a service called SageMaker Pipelines that lets you build those automated pipelines as well. So these are probably the three things I would look at. But again, all all three are a good starting point because again, you know, use what you know, build on your existing skills, and then you know, figure out if you need to switch to something different or not. Okay, be super pragmatic about this. Perfect. I agree. I mean, uh, one thing which I uh, which I loved what you said is that uh, be aware of uh, the capabilities what exists within your organization, uh, because uh, there are a lot of information which is uh, flowing around in the in the industry, uh, and uh, you have to be cognizant of the fact that w- out of that, what is most relevant for the ecosystem within your operating, and setting up the goals on top of that. That is very very important uh, instead of getting uh, blown away by what is what you're reading or what you're seeing in the in the media. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't listen to. Yeah. Exactly. It's. I think it's a good conclusion. You know, come up, come up with your own conclusions. Do your own homework. Uh, run your own tests, and factor in. You know, your skills and your business environment. And it's not because you read a blog post that says blah blah blah, or, or even you know, even listen. You listen to me saying blah blah blah. Okay. Think for yourselves and build a solution that works in your context. You know, business, technical, skills, cost, etc. You need to experiment and figure out what works best for you. Okay, that's it's the I think it's the it's a good learning in IT in general, and it certainly applies in uh, for machine learning as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so with this, uh, we uh, have come to the close of today's uh, ML Friday's uh, session. Uh, uh, Julian, thanks a lot uh, for sharing your knowledge uh, with with the uh, participants who joined for the day, uh, and I really thank all the participants who uh, took time from their day schedule uh, to invest one and a half hours uh, listening to us uh, and how we look at the overall eco- ecosystem and how you should be building your uh, ML ecosystem. Uh, I would request you all to please fill up the feedback form and if you have any further questions or you want to explore how uh, exactly you can go about doing machine learning within your organization, please feel to reach out uh, reach out back to us uh, uh, on, on the mails uh, on, on which you got confirmation for this uh, webinar and we'll be more than happy to engage uh, with you and help you on your journey of machine learning. So with this, uh, once again, thanks a lot uh, and I'll uh, close the seminar for the day. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.